Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends, I would like to wish you a warm welcome to this lecture by President Alexander Kanevsky. It's a great pleasure for us, President, that you are visiting us today and giving a lecture in the framework of our Debating Europe discussion series. As everybody knows, Mr. Kanievski has been President of the Republic of Poland from 1995 to 2005. Elected in 1995, he won the elections against Lex Walesa and he has been re-elected for a second term in 2000. During his presidency, he was a strong proponent of European integration and a main actor in preparing Poland's accession to the UI. Uh, to the EU, I had the opportunity of meeting you there at that time and knowing how strong are you European feelings. Before becoming president, he was active in Polish politics from the 1970s and 89. He participated in the well-known roundtable negotiations discussing with the banned trade unions, Radis Nox and other opposition groups. And finally, allowing the peaceful transformation of Poland from communism to democracy. He was co-founding member and first chairman of the Polish Social Democratic Party. He studied transport economics and foreign train at the University of Gangs and was appointed distinguished scholar in the practice of global leadership at the Georgetown University in 2006. It is not the first time that you come here. We have discovered in the book uh, that you came almost 10 years ago. Time flies. Time flies. Time flies. 10 years later, you come here again to speak on the future of Europe and the EU neighborhood. He will focus to extend the EU's neighborhood and how can influence the future of Europe and keeping in mind the, the difficult times that the EU is today and the fact that Poland is currently holding the EU presidency, this focus is certainly of high relevance for all of us. The relationship and cooperation with its neighborhood certainly is one of the major issues that we are confronting today. It fits very well on this debating Europe series with which we want to focus on the process of European integration. We are going also to do this time, for the first time, a new format of the lectures. President Kavniewski will speak for around 30 minutes, and his speech will be followed by comments for Professor Maris Cremona, the head of our law department, who is an expert on the topic. And then Professor Cremona will guide the following discussion with the researchers and professors attending your lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you, President. Thank you very much. Dear President Borrell, uh, distinguished professors, students, ladies and gentlemen, really, I was here almost 10 years ago because my signature is from 28th February 2002. Ten uh, years. Yes, almost 10 years, and I think the atmosphere of um, our debate those times was a little bit different as atmosphere today because uh, I remember that my speech or my lecture this time was about the future of Europe, and now will be about the future of Europe also. <laughs> uh, and uh, We still have a future. <laughs> and that is what, what you mentioned now. We still have a future, and I'm sure that it's not a bad future. Well, so, dear friends, it's a great pleasure to speak at the European University Institute in Florence today in the Debating Europe series. I would like to express my gratitude to the president of the European University Institute in Florence, Mr. Joseph Borrell, for his kind invitation. He's a good friend of mine and of Poland, a personality that has been instrumental in enlarging of the European Union in 2004. The positive role played today in the European Union by some key Central European countries, including Poland, is the most excellent reward for his engagement and leadership. I'm here today not only as a, the former president of Poland and the European citizen, but also as chairman of the European Council on Tolerance and Reconciliation, an NGO I have initiated together with Mr. Moshe Kantor, the president of the European Jewish Congress. 
We have been just debating with President Borrell on the ECTR proposal to establish here in Florence a European Centre on Tolerance and Security. It is planned to form a part of the European response to the social and political challenges to the European Union. Ladies and gentlemen, Poland is just approaching to the end of its first historical EU presidency. I must say that I have to pinch myself when thinking that Poland is actually at the helm of the EU. We spent in the past so much time and effort getting into the EU that actually running it seems extraordinary. What is more, Poland is today an anchor of stability in Europe, enjoying what many people call a golden decade. Not be too fortunate, we are holding the presidency in a period which is more difficult than ever. Every time I travel outside of Europe, I can sense how much concern there is about the future course and stability of Europe. This is certainly not the way to retain influence. The best European foreign policy starts at home today and consists of putting our own house in order. Before that happens, we can forget about changing the world to our liking. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to share with you in the beginning a few thoughts on the crisis in Europe and the ways to solve it. Last week, both the Polish Prime Minister Donald Tusk and the Foreign Minister Radosław Sikorski, in a much discussed speech in Berlin, presented the Polish vision of the future of the European Union. I must say I was very pleased that Poland spoke up in such a clear language calling on European partners to leave behind what Freud called the narcissism of minor differences and choose a more integrated future. Radosław Sikorski, Polish Minister of Foreign Affairs, was right when he said in Berlin, I quote, I fear German power less than its inactivity. Germany holds the key to solving the crisis and you should not wait with drawing the conclusions until it's too late. Good that Germany can feel the support of Poland in this challenging time, just before the coming December summit, EU summit in Brussels. I have no doubt that in the, if the euro is to be saved, there will have to be deeper integration with more financial self-discipline, more joint budgetary planning and supervision. Fiscal union, or stability union, as our German friends prefer to call it, should enable joint issuance of debt and also more scope for an active role of the European Central Bank in solving the crisis. I believe not every member state will be ready and willing to subscribe to this vision. Also Poland in the past has been worried about being left out in the process of integration. We have been suspicious of attempts to form a two-speed Europe and feared that it would lead to, the, to a division of Europe. However, today's circumstances are different. They require leaving aside old preferences and prejudice, prejudices. If putting together a European avant-garde is the only credible way of achieving, uh, achieving a fiscal union and saving the Euro, then it is everybody's interest to see to materialize. Important is to guarantee an open character of the agreements. If the fiscal union starts on the basis of an intergovernmental treaty in line with the model of the Schengen Convention, it should be open to non-Eurozone countries such as Poland right from the, from the beginning. Poland is obliged to adopt the Euro and the Polish public, uh, public is today among the most Euro-enthusiastic in Europe. My country is firmly at the heart of the integration projects, ready to contribute <coughs> to the European renewal. Technocratic solutions may be necessary in the midst of the crisis, but Europe has always been and remains a political project. This means that without creating a new sense of legitimacy, we might forget about moving to the new stage in the project. 
Jürgen Habermas is right that we should move towards strengthening the European demos. Some people say it should have been done years ago and it is too late now. I agree on the first point and disagree on the second. It's not, it is not only today's crisis that will have a powerful unifying impact on the Europeans. It is also the way we react to the next stage of globalization and how we face the long-term structural challenges, such as those of our demographic future, that will bring us together. Of course, the reality needs to be helped. Joint lists in the election to the European Parliament are often discussed in this context. I think we should go beyond that and organize European Parliament elections on the same day and in line with the same procedures. Just imagine the powerful impact of a single European electoral night with results showing the performance of European political families. The worst thing that could happen to us is a, um, is a sense of resignation, suggesting that Europe cannot be fixed and that the Europeans have turned away from the project for good. The electorates may have become skeptical, but it is because we have never really tried to have them on board. Too many people thought that Europe is such a unique creation that it does not need to be justified. It is time now for some serious catching up. Ladies and gentlemen, the Polish European Union presidency is a Lisbon Treaty presidency. I want to say that probably Lisbon went too far in taking competences away from foreign ministers. They become orphans of the treaty not present at the European Council any longer, and having their role during presidency largely replaced by the high representative. Becoming more effective is all fine, but sometimes it happens at the expense of vast experience and expertise in the capitals. Happily, practical arrangements have been made between Poland and Baroness Ashton and her team for the Polish presidency to offer a helping hand on a range of issues, including the transformation agenda in the Arab world and the Eastern Partnership. This is the mutual benefit and synergy. Openness is one of the main themes of the Polish European Union presidency. This is basically about EU enlargement and neighborhood. I have always thought the enlargement is the EU at its best. I believe each enlargement is governed by a different paradigm. When we joined the European Union in 2004, it was about reunification of Europe. Broadly speaking, it was about correcting a historical injustice and overcoming the old division of Europe. The enlargement to Western Balkan countries is not governed by that logic. For me, it is driven by Europe's remorse about not doing enough about the Balkans war in the 90s. We have some tangible results which can be achieved in the next months with the accession treaty of Croatia, ready to be signed later in December, and possible launching of the talks with Serbia sometime in the next few months. Turkish accession is clearly a different story altogether. For me, there will be a realistic prospect of Turkish accession if the EU decides to become a global power intent on projecting its influence outside of its borders. The, reali the reality, however, is that Turkish negotiations are blocked and there is no clear way out uh, of the impasse. The EU has run out of chapters to open while the wider issue of the borders of the EU might return to us any time to the next few months, especially as we get closer to election in some countries. Dear friends, when Poland says openness, it also has in mind an active neighborhood policy oriented towards the eastern and southern partners. Our European neighborhood is special. It provides huge hopes and big disappointments, one after the other. I witnessed and helped the Orange Revolution in Ukraine. Our hearts are now more with the North African countries, which proved a few months ago that nothing is impossible. 
just a handful of people expected political change to take place in the Arab countries. And yet it came about through courage and dedication of thousands of Tunisians, Egyptians and Libyans. Poland has traditionally focused more on Eastern Europe, which we know better, and which is strategically as important as North Africa. The most concrete result of our presidency was uh, meant to be the conclusion of the talks with Ukraine on the new association agreement. In new policy terms, this is a very innovative uh, arrangement with deep comprehensive free trade being its key aspect, making it the most far-reaching package ever concluded with a third country. The negotiations have been difficult, given the stakes involved. Regulatory harmonization is always tricky. One of the former Polish prime ministers who was responsible for Polish association agreement said that these were the bloodiest negotiations he ever participated in. Aside of trade, the real secret purpose of the arrangement of the agreement is to transform the way Ukraine is governed and the way you can do business there. They, these are fundamental issues. The truth is that most of the European neighborhood, whether east or south, has missed the train of, of globalization. These countries have not managed to find a niche for themselves in the global economy and continue to be run in an opaque and intransparent manner. Looking at structural reforms in Eastern Europe, their record is patchy. Georgia is the regional leader with a high position in the World Bank, doing business ranking, eighth position in the world. Ukraine is trailing behind with the 145th overall position and the close to the bottom of the scale in the category of paying taxes and corruption. This is important because in the global economy, which will emerge from the crisis, structural reforms will matter rather more than less. There will be more intensive global competition and more struggle to outperform each other, so countries like Ukraine or Egypt would better realize that there will be no mercy from them if what they want to attract FDI and the interest of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, the association agreement is ready to sign and everything depends now on whether <coughs> Kiev will set free the former Prime Minister Timoshenko, who has been in arrest since August. The odds are not very good. My successor, President Komorowski, made a last ditch appeal to President Yanukovych last week, but all of that we heard in response was a promise of proper medical treatment for Mr. Timoshenko. This is not good enough. Ukraine is wasting a historical opportunity to repeat Poland's path to prosperity and democracy. In February last year, the economist called on Lady Ashton to turn east and make a real difference in Ukraine. I quote, Ukraine badly needs attention and unlike America or China, it is not a place over which other European Union leaders will be fighting for influence. I'm afraid that there is no a sense of resignation about Eastern Europe in Brussels and around the European Union. I agree with economists that we cannot give up on the organic work of keeping up the aspirations of the millions of Ukrainians to join the open democratic world community. Having said that, we should go forward in December in <coughs> Kiev and not let pass by a historical opportunity to set the stage for a closer relationship with Ukraine. This is why I strongly believe that the association agreement should be at least uh, initial in order to signal that the EU offers is on the table. American diplomats call this strategic patience. I am more than certain that it will pay off. Ladies and gentlemen, I was fascinated by the Arab revolutions uh, we witnessed earlier this year. 
Financial Times captured the sense of astonishment in January and tightening one of its articles, Democracy is back, how awkward. The rise of China and the Beijing consensus had earlier seemed to suggest there was an alternative path to that of democracy. Francis Fukuyama wrote about this, that it, the choice is between a high quality authoritarian system or a deadlocked, paralyzed democratic one with lots of checks and balances. Referring to the new low efficiency of the US political system and troubles of the European democracies. But in Africa, it's, it turned out that us Europeans have mistakenly misinterpreted stabilization with stagnation. In the southern neighborhood, the linear scenario are unlikely. Every transformation is different, but it's worth looking at what Central Europe has been through. Our own experience points to the importance of three factors. Institution building, unleashing the entrepreneurial spirit in the economy and the role of media with their checks and balances. Institutions are important because they provide the backbone for the transformation in the first disorderly period. In Poland, we had 28 parties in the parliament in the early 90s. Institutions of democracy and rule of law serve to smooth out the transition. Dear friends, crises are what often makes or breaks EU presidencies. Crises are what often makes or breaks European Union presidents. They call for leadership and mobilize public and political support. The one crisis which seems to fade away into a more distant future is Belarus. It had been assumed that economic tensions that would translate themselves into a rising pressure for political change. Nothing of the type has happened. We are back to the situation in which President Lukashenko can further enjoy the benefits of his opaque relationships with Moscow with subsidized gas imports. Such a situation encourages him to be tough and sometimes brutal with his own population. We need to be a tough, as tough defending democratic values as human rights. If there cannot be a change through approximation, they would, should be approximation through change. There is no room for compromise if all we hear in exchange is more abuse and violence directed at ordinary people. What is more, I believe that the Arab revolutions teach us at least one lesson. It is a new type of stakeholders that will be decisive for the change to take place in oppressed societies like Belarus. In Eastern Europe, we should also look for new agents of change, especially among the young people and small and medium-sized entrepreneurs. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, Europe's ability to project influence in the world is slowly reduced as a result of the economic crisis. We all know that. However, I still think that we give ground too easily to the doom and gloom scenarios. There is every reason to believe that the current period is formative for the European Union. In foreign policy, it could be as important as the 90s, when common foreign and security policy was born in the hills of the Balkans. Our neighborhood is waiting for us and will not understand if we will turn inwards and only deal with what is in our own purse. We cannot fail them, and I think that is a message which I would like to deliver to you in this important discussion about the future of Europe. So, now I thank you for your attention, and now I'm ready to answer your questions. I like such more interactive form of debate, so I'm to your disposal. Thank you very much. Thank you, President. Maurice, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Mr. President, I think it's very important that in your lecture today you, you bring together 
the EU's neighbourhood policy enlargement and the current euro crisis. As you say, effective influence beyond our borders is going to depend on successful domestic policy making, both because what happens to the EU economies will have an impact globally and because we've so often held ourselves out as a model of economic integration and stability, not least in our neighbourhood. But I couldn't agree more with your plea that the EU should not simply turn in inward and become obsessed with its own problems. So I, I wanted to say something um, briefly now about um, these three central issues, the neighbourhood policy enlargement and the, and the euro crisis, from the perspective, a particular perspective which interests me, and that is the perspective of conditionality and uh, solidarity. And in doing so, I'm, I'll come back to some of the points that, you, that you've made in your, in your speech. I wanted to start with the, with the neighbourhood policy. We all know that um, the neighbourhood policy is one of the key uh, external policies of the European Union since its uh, inception in, in 2004, and that it's the policy framework that the EU uses for its relations with the, its eastern and southern neighbours. Um, and in particular, in relation to the East, we have now have the Eastern Partnership, which was launched in 2009, where Poland played a, an important part in that, um, in that process. Um, and indeed has played an important part, I think, over the years in developing the, the, the neighbourhood policy right from the, um, the, even before Polish accession to, to the European Union and certainly afterwards. Um, the neighbourhood policy has given rise to a great deal of interest and comment since its inception by reason both of its rationale and of its methodology. Scholars have commented on the use of um, enlargement methodology in the neighbourhood, the use of soft instruments, of soft power, the breadth of its scope covering what were the all three pillars of union activities. It's, been, it's also been criticised as well as commented on. And, um, one of those critiques uh, in particular, which uh, is the critique of the use of enlargement methodology, and in particular one of its key concepts, which is conditionality, and, and I wanted to say a little bit about that. Um, in its first stage, I think the neighbourhood policy was, very, was, very, was noted for its adoption of an enlargement-based um, methodology, including conditionality, but also including regular action plans, benchmarking, target setting, the use of twinning, uh, the TIEX system, and so on. To some extent, it was due to the desire to repeat a successful policy. Um, to some extent, it was due to the personnel involved. But it was also problematic. Many people pointed out the difficulty of managing conditionality without the carrot of EU membership, or at any rate, without a clear shared objective. Other, others pointed to the fact that in so far as it was successful, the neighbourhood policy would be creating potential candidate states, and it was not clear that, that, that this was what the EU wanted. Although not all these methodologies are being replaced, I think it's true to say that as the neighbourhood policy has matured, it has developed its own instruments and approaches which do not follow the enlargement model. It's managed to differentiate itself more clearly from enlargement, and one might point in this to precisely the development of the deep and comprehensive free trade agreements which uh, you mentioned and which are being negotiated now uh, with, uh, with Ukraine. It could be argued that the use of conditionality um, has been symptomatic of an asymmetry in the relationship between the EU and its neighbours. Uh, that the integration and adaptation was all one way. The agenda being set by the EU, the focus on union priorities, including border security, regional stability, the rule of law. Economic integration being presented as an incentive rather than as a shared objective. I think uh, in this sense, in this context, the Eastern uh, partnership has managed to make the idea of partnership and of joint ownership, which is one of the key notions behind the neighbourhood policy, more real. There are more, there are more references to mutual accountability. There are the, the, we have the Eastern Partnership summits. Um, we have a, a, a 
more of an emphasis on the role of civil society, which, as you were saying at the end of your speech just now, I think is, is crucial to any kind of um, transformation. We have um, uh, more of an emphasis on um, participation in EU programs and agencies, and we have the fact that, as you say, the, the deep and comprehensive free trade agreements offer a real uh, a degree of integration, which um, uh, the sense I have is that the EU is even a little alarmed, in a way, about the degree of integration which it is potentially offering to the neighbouring countries. And um, that the, in the Commission, there's, there's, there's a lot of thought going on about what precisely this is going to mean um, in practical terms and in terms of governance. But in, in spite of, this, uh, of these changes of, um, and uh, development of the neighbourhood policy, it's still true to say, I think, that conditionality is at the heart of the neighbourhood uh, policy. And we've just, as we've just heard, it's playing a part in the future of the deep and comprehensive free trade agreement that's being negotiated, um, that's under negotiation with Ukraine the question of whether or not it will be initialed or will be signed is, is, is um, based not only on agreement on the terms of the, of, the, of, the, of the text itself, but also on the behavior of Ukraine, and that is a, an example of conditionality. I was very pleased to hear you say that um, openness was a major theme, or is a major theme, of the Polish presidency, and that this openness applies both to enlargement and to the neighbourhood. Um, in 2004, the year of Polish entry into the European Union, um, I wrote a, a paper which was arguing that both the enlargement and the EU's neighbourhood policy need to be based on a foundation of solidarity and that solidarity implies a fundamental openness or inclusiveness um, on the part of the EU and in the nature of the EU, that it's saying something about the nature of the European Union as such. Of course, by this, um, I don't mean that the EU and its member states believe or should believe that all European states should join the EU or even that they should conclude deep integration uh, agreements with the EU, and nor that the EU will or should extend an unconditional welcome to all applicants. It is more, I think, that the EU accepts as, at a fundamental level both that membership should be an option for all European states and the consequent obligation to assist in the fulfillment of the essential criteria for accession. And that's where conditionality comes in and has uh, become or, or been such an important um, uh, element, not only of the neighbourhood policy, but also of the, um, of the European Union's enlargement policy. Um, and I, I just, uh, just to say something a bit about enlargement and to put it in its context, um, I think the process of enlargement um, is now very different. If you look at the process of the enlargement um, in respect of Croatia, for example, that's, that's just being completed. Um, and uh, I, I have to say, this is on a personal note for myself, since I, I've been visiting Croatia and talking to the um, uh, to Croatian academics and members of the government since 1999, for me it's very moving to see that this accession treaty with Croatia is going to be signed uh, later, later this week, I think, at yeah. the summit. Um, I think that's, that's wonderful. Um, but enlargement has changed, hasn't it, over the years, that it's moved from being I, I would say it's moved from being a procedure to being a policy. Um, and this in itself points to the dual nature of enlargement. It's a policy of the union, but on the other hand, a treaty of accession, such as go, is going to be con signed with Croatia later this week, is a treaty concluded by the member states as, members, as states, sovereign states. So it has this dual perspective. Um, it's an ongoing policy process with a continuing procession of countries accepted as potential candidates and then candidates and ultimately members. In addition to Croatia, there are eight countries involved at the moment 
at more or less um, distant uh, dist distances, if you like, from, from accession. And over the years and over different enlargements, we can see shifts in the balance between these two dimensions of enlargement, the dimension which sees it as a union policy and the dimension which sees it as belonging to the member states and needing the agreement of the member states. And it's been argued that a number of developments in recent years represent an increased level of control by the member states. Um, uh, what one commentator has called a renationalization of enlargement policy. Adjustments to the accession procedure by reinterpreting Article uh, 49 rules, or it, the introduction of benchmarks, stricter application of membership criteria, um, increased emphasis on absorption capacity, and even de facto barriers to enlargement imposed at bilateral national level. Perhaps the surprising thing is not that enlargement has been renationalized, but that it was ever denationalized or institutionalized to the extent that it was. It, it's possible, perhaps, that we're now reverting to the position prior to the 1990s for a relatively brief but very important period covering the Efton enlargement and the 2004-2007 Central and Eastern European enlargements. There was a, a, the process of accession became a policy of enlargement, as I've said, and the emphasis was on the management of enlargement institutionally rather than on the acceptance of a specific accession by each existing member state. I think this was for a number of reasons. The lack of controversy over the EFTA states joining the EU, the fact that the member states had to make a credible political commitment to enlargement to Central and Eastern Europe in the early 1990s, thus changing the question from whether to when. The size of the Central and Eastern European enlargement also played a part, the need to demonstrate the objectivity of the almost technocratic process as a way of dealing with its intensely political nature and its inherently competitive dimension. So what then has prompted the reversion, if there is a reversion, and I don't want to exaggerate this, to a more member state driven process? It's clear that the group of states that are actual or potential candidates is more diverse. The attitude of the member states is more di di uh, divided than in previous enlargements. We can also point to so-called enlargement fatigue. All these no doubt play a part. But I'd like to mention um, another dimension, which is this, a, a deeper sense of the degree of solidarity which is implied by EU membership not only as a motive for enlargement, but also as a continuing principle of membership. And that, and that enlargement involves extending that solidarity and that integration ever more widely. Um, I'll explain what I mean by this very, very briefly. There is a renewed understanding, I think, that enlargement is not just a matter of how many commissioners there are or how many votes in council each member state has, but that our actual level of integration implies a tangible commitment to solidarity between member states. The Euro crisis has brought home just what that commitment might entail, as well as the difficulties of managing deep integration between countries that are still very different in terms of economic management and performance. Uh, for, for the lawyers here, the Viking and Laval cases have brought home the challenges in operating an internal market, which includes countries with very different social bargains. Both the examples of the Euro crisis and the Viking and Laval cases involve impacts on the individual citizen and the taxpayer. The point is that these events and others have brought home the fact that membership of the Union and the admission of new members carry serious solidarity implications. No wonder, perhaps, that enlargement is being repoliticized and renationalized. But solidarity has an external as well as an internal dimension. We're all very much aware, and, and the President um, alluded to it, of the fact that the EU's policy towards Central and Eastern Europe, and I would say actually also towards Southeast Europe, um, was, is not only a successful foreign, foreign policy contributing to achieving broader foreign policy aims of the EU, 
um, but it also has immense political and even psychological significance as a return to Europe, in quotation marks, by the central eastern and southeastern European states, a, re a reunification of Europe, with sig significant and problematic potential for redrawing the boundaries of and within Europe. So it has significance beyond its current membership and with its explicit conditionality, it's become an instrument of economic, political, and legal change. The relationship between, and this is the last point I want to make, the, between solidarity and conditionality is a complex one, both within the context of enlargement policy and increasingly within the EU. As originally conceived, enlargement conditionality played a gatekeeping role, making possible the EU's internal solidarity based on mutual trust and loyalty. The need to establish trust, and not least to establish the institutional mechanisms which are the foundation for that trust, is one objective of the different elements of the pre-accession process, including conditionality. To put it simply, strong conditionality before accession made possible strong solid solidarity between EU members after accession. But the 2004 and 2007 enlargements introduced a new element into the accession treaties, an element which has been replicated in the draft accession treaty with Croatia, and which accepts a, con a continuation of conditionality for a limited period after accession, through monitoring and the possibility of safeguard measures being taken where there's a failure to implement commitments. Um, Significantly, this importing of conditionality into the internal system of the EU so that it is no longer, longer limited to pre-accession but continues as the complement to internal solidarity is also a defining feature of the EU's response to the Euro crisis at the moment, the most serious crisis in its history. So uh, we can see that it's clear that applying conditions prior to admittance to the Eurozone is not enough that some form of regular and potentially intrusive monitoring of domestic economic policy by the EU institutions is increasingly accepted as inevitable and necessary given the degree of solidarity demanded by monetary union. And that this conditionality is no, not only applicable for a limited post-accession period, but is becoming entrenched in the very conception of membership. The need to link solidarity and conditionality is a lesson from enlargement, which will profoundly affect the future character of the union, in my view. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Could you give me your text? Thank you. Yes. Thank you. So now, uh, I made some uh, response to some of the issues uh, that were raised uh, in our in a very, what was in fact a, a very rich lecture, I think, and raised all kinds of questions uh, about the current policy of the European Union, which I didn't touch on. So feel free to offer comments, questions on, on any aspect um, of, of the lecture, um, of the, the discussion of the, the question of the two-speed Europe, which also links to the comments that I was making about solidarity, is solidarity compatible with the two-speed Europe? Um, those kinds of questions. Um, but I leave the floor open now. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Mr. President, first of all, for your speech. And second of all, I have a, quite a basic question, I would say. All the things you mentioned, for example, we need a more coherent foreign policy, what is lacking is more legitimacy, um, we need a European demos, are, are very fundamental points I, I and we all, I guess, agree on. At the same time, whenever we hear such things, it's quite striking because I think when we look two years back, this is exactly what the Lisbon Treaty was supposed to bring us. You know, exactly these catchwords were offered as, as being tackled with the introduction of the Lisbon Treaty. Um, now, my question would be uh, what your judgment uh, on, on this, let's say, say, paradox or puzzle is. Is it because the Lisbon Treaty is weak? Is it because it's not properly implemented? Or is it possibly simply because we are in a, in a difficult economic crisis and that there is too much focus on, on 
on other problems? It's a very good question. And see, I, I, first of all, I would like to, 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 to say that um, I'm politician, she's academic. So that's my answers are much more political and not um, uh, uh, very academic, maybe. Uh, I think that the first problem, uh, if, if you want to, because that's right, uh, the, the Lisbon Treaty uh, is speaking about many of these uh, challenges and problems and uh, give us some instruments even to, 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 to make something on this field. But I think the first uh, problem is that this Lisbon Treaty was too late. You remember that we, we, we waste a lot of time with constitutional treaty and with referendum in, in France and Holland, and, and uh, uh, then uh, the procedure with Lisbon Treaty was quite long. And why I'm speaking about this factor of time, because this period, I mean, last seven, after enlargement, better to say, so last seven years, it was a time of dramatic changes in the global world. And I think if in these changes with the increasing role of, of China, decreasing role of United States, increasing role of India, of Brazil, changing role of Russia, etc., etc., if you have such uh, organization as European Union, which is going very slow, is not prepared for new situation, that is, uh, you know, that is the, 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 the real problem. We are right, but we are too late. We have ideas, but we have no time for implementation. And our reaction today, even using uh, Lisbon Treaty, are not enough, are not uh, enough strong. Um, so they, 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 that is the reason why Merkel and Sarkozy are speaking about the changes of, 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 of treaty. Because in some elements we have absolutely new situation and everything what was good and, and uh, clever in the Lisbon Treaty is ineffective today. So I think the fact of time was um, um, uh, the first. The second, I think that is a problem of uh, much deeper and, and, and even, uh, I don't know if, if, if you, it was possible to avoid this, 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 this problem, because when communism collapsed, and it happened exactly 20 years ago, remember December 91, the Soviet Union is uh, disappeared and we have a new situation. And of course, this 20 years after communist collapse was time of so kind of vacuum in which we were sure that we have time for everything and, and the situation will not, uh, not change. And in my opinion, European Union had in this situation of new arrangement of the world, when this new architecture of the global world uh, was started to construct, is, is, uh, decided about one historical <coughs> positive thing, and lost time or uh, lost energy in the second element. What was historical positive? It was enlargement. Of course, I'm not extremely objective in this uh, question because I'm represent I'm former president of Poland, and of course, from my perspective, it was really a historical decision because if Europe today is a Europe of 500 million people, it means that Europe with this potential is better prepared to the global competition which we have now in the world. And that is, that is some, of course, uh, respecting all these um, problems, tensions, conflicts, etc., what enlargement as such um, created as well. And it was good. What was wrong? That we didn't understand 20 years ago that the future of Europe is the deeper integration, more Europe, not less Europe, and finally some kind of federalization of Europe. And um, the last 20 years, that's some kind, what you mentioned, of renocialization of many politics, of the position of many uh, members of the European Union. And today, we have one thing which was, we, thanks God, is decided, and we have a large Europe, what is okay, but the institutions of Europe are too, too weak to react on these challenges which we have now. And I understand that the proposals of, 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 of um, uh, Merkel and Sarkozy are going, not in my opinion, far uh, enough, but are going in this direction. And we need that the treaties, the changes in the treaties where they give more power for European, European institutions. And last point, because your question, that is a good subject for next lecture, and if you invite me, maybe not next 10 years, but a little bit earlier to, to, to Florence, I, uh, we will discuss this issue. But third point, which I want to, to, to underline, is of course the main weakness, in my opinion, of European Union from the very beginning, from the very beginning, is the lack of European demos. So we have 
great political project, maybe one of the greatest is the, in the history of civilization, because something that was response and the result of the two uh, world wars, um, uh, the, 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 the millions of victims, so on. And in this, this political project is still is working quite effectively and uh, was guaranteed for Europe almost 60 years of peace, of security, of cooperation, of reconciliation, of, of, of uh, open borders, of, of uh, good education, etc. But unfortunately, we didn't create the, the real European demos. And you remember that before Second, Second World War, um, uh, when there was a, the, 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 the fear of, of, of uh, the Nazis attack against Poland, was a good question discussed in London and Paris, who is ready to die for Danzig? And today we have a question, maybe the situation is not so dramatic, but we have a question, how many Europeans are ready to die for Europe, for European integration? And that's just, thanks God, it's not necessary to die. It's necessary to live and to, 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 to work. To give and up your pension rights. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> to, to give up the pension rights. It's, the, 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 it's not necessary to sacrifice so much. But this is the question that we need much more these European demos. We need, of course, uh, better communication between European structures, uh, especially Commission, uh, European Parliament, etc., and, and, and uh, citizens. And we need um, uh, strong national leadership in all European countries, which are working in favor of European Union, European, uh, uh, European uh, integration, etc. Uh, today, Poland is uh, uh, in a good situation because really the majority, the constitutional majority in Polish parliament and the, uh, is, is uh, very pro-European. We have a very noisy and quite dangerous group, but they, they can have no more as 30% of votes. They, they are, well, diplomatically speaking, Eurosceptics, but frankly speaking, they are Euro, Euro opponents or, or Euro, Euro, anti-Euro fighters. Uh, but that's a that's uh, unique situation in, in, in Europe. If you see the situation, many uh, majority of 27 countries that this, this uh, will, willingness to, to, to fight for European perspective is not so strong. And that is, that is something what I think needs um, uh, activity, needs engagement of, of all of us now. But to create this European demos, we need time. And the problem is that we have not time. And this is some kind of, 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 of drama which, which, which is, is part of, of, of the situation now. Thank you. I've got a couple of, uh, couple of questions. Perhaps should we take a couple and then uh, have It's quite dangerous because if it's a couple, the answers are too long. Maybe it's better one to one and then, okay. then, then it's. it's uh, the, the, like. Yeah, That's but just the, 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 the discussion is, is more lively. Okay. This was Yes, hello. I'm Anna Trinda Felide, professor at the Schumann Center. I think I'll take the temptation and be more political than academic. Um, in reaction also to Fabian Breuer's question, I think we, why we have the same questions today is because we didn't have the constitutional treaty because the electorates of some countries rejected it and then we just put it in from the window, uh, ignoring what citizens thought of it. That's why we had the Lisbon Treaty, it was not just the loss of time, it was just doing something that was against uh, the, the public sentiment and it was a watered down version. So uh, the impetus was not there. And what we're witnessing today is conditionality and solidarity, I like this idea very much, but we witnessed this within the EU. Now we are having conditionality in order to have solidarity as member states. Um, but I'm afraid we're again losing the focus on two questions. Is what does EU citizenship mean then when you have conditionality for solidarity among member states who are, have been accepted? And second, still ignoring the question, what kind of Europe do we want? What kind of the EU do we want? And uh, what, um, I mean, I'm, I'm a migration expert myself, but I happen to be a Greek citizen living in Italy. So I had some journalists asking me, what do you think, why is now that the leaders of Germany or France are in the forefront and not the leaders of the EU? I think you were just whispering the, 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 the answer is when you select two very valuable people, but unknown to the general public, this is what you, you were looking for it, you know. You, no one selected a leader that had been, um, you know, very prominent. Uh, it was just the idea that the, the big member states and maybe the small member states as well, they wanted somebody who is as unknown as possible. I had put it very short. We wanted Tony Blair and we got Lady Ashton.
only short <coughs> comment because I think, in my of course, that's that is the, the, the history. But uh, in my opinion, the constitutional treaty it was something very important, and and we lost a great chance. Because frankly speaking, uh, the result maybe in Holland it was much more connected with the problem of migrants and with some let's say European uh, uh, background. But frankly speaking, I was those times several times in France. Uh, the result of French referendum about European constitution it was a vote against President Chirac, and it was extremely domestic um, uh, question. It wasn't absolutely not uh, interlinked with, with um, uh, European affairs. Of course, nobody was so courageous to say to Mr. Chirac that the best of what he can do for France and for Europe is to uh, resign and, and to support the uh, constitutional treaty by, by his resignation, you know. But frankly speaking, that, that's, that is the next problem. How in this situation which we have in all countries, with coming election, etc., how to have enough strong pro-European leadership which is ready to separate these two things. I mean, this European conditionalities or necessities, or how we want to describe it, and domestic policy, which is uh, the number one, especially if you are some days before the election. You know, that, that's, that's, that's the problem. This is the problem of European Union. This is the problem of democratic European Union. It would be not a big problem of undemocratic European Union, but thanks God we are democratic European Union. But I think um, uh, this uh, lack of strong leadership, pro-European leadership, that is one of, of, of the real problems. That is not, uh, and I, I don't like to speak about uh, the, the leaders of, of, of European institutions today, but, but uh, in, in national states, in the, in the, in the, in, we have not enough, not enough strong and enough, not enough mm -hmm. active pro-European leaders. That's, yes. that's the real problem. And that can be very, very costly and mm -hmm. risky for the future. Adrienne. I would like to make two comments or both questions. I think there is a certain tension on the, uh, uh, by invoking on the one side uh, a demos, the building of a demos, the developing of a demos, and at the same time, of course, welcoming enlargement because in order to build a demos, you take a long, long time, decades and decades, if not centuries, to build it, then even in smaller political units. So I think these two objectives, in a way, are contradicting, are con strongly conflicting with each other. The question is, how do you kind of solve this question then? And my second point is uh, what Marie said, uh, that was in a way new, it's true, you're absolutely right, that there is a new conditionality now within, in, as it were, the old or existing member states or members of the Eurozone. And if you apply these new conditions, these new conditions of conditionality to potential new members, it's even more difficult, I mean, even more hopeless ever to join, right, and become a member. Comment. I think that's, that's absolutely right what you said, and, and when we speak about uh, European demos, of course, we speak about very, very long uh, process in which we have a lot of um, contradictory elements. That's true. But that will be provocative, what I, I will say now. I think, for, because, you know, Europeans, uh, last 60 years, uh, especially Western Europeans, they are very lucky people, you know. They have um, uh, peace, they have security, they have uh, 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 money and, and, and not bad pension still. Um, uh, and of course, a lot of positive results uh, of European integration, they are accepted and absolutely obvious. Nobody discussed today that something is because that is a result of European integration. European integration is part of our life. And there's nothing special, that's obvious. And of course, uh, maybe today, if you want to um, accelerate the process of creation, of establishment of European demos, we need some real fear. Because this fear existed in Europe quite a long time. And the name of this fear was communism and Soviet Union. And because of Soviet Union, integration in Western Europe was quite smooth and, 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 uh, and accepted because, you know, this, this problem of, of, of communism was so close next door. 
Then, last 20 years, we have, in my opinion, uh, to some extent, unstable feeling that everything is okay. You know, we are in, in, in the huge space of Europe without the Balkans. It was the last uh, big, big um, uh, conflict, uh, but today we are, we are happy and, and, and we have time and it's not necessary to speed up our efforts or to sacrifice something. It's okay. And that is why it's provocative. Maybe we need new fear. We need new element or which will um, uh, destabilize our good feeling, our good mood after uh, our, you know, such sense of, 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 of stability. And of course, I see such fear which is existing and is, will come. And the name of this fear is very easy to, 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 to uh, express. It's China. It's China. Because the Chinese factor for the economy, for the political role in, in, in the world, it will be really the problem and the real challenge for Europeans. And if in this global world we want to be prepared to compete with Chinese economy, Chinese political position, with Chinese influence, with Chinese long-term strategy, which is very, very um, uh, spectacular, significant in Africa, for example, in Latin America, well, if you see the list of investments in Latin America, I was last days in Ecuador, you know that China is with huge gap um, uh, beyond all these um, uh, other, including United States countries. So maybe if we will finally realize in Europe that we have competitor, and in this competition we can be effective if we are together and we will more European, this factor will accelerate, accelerate maybe to some extent the process of establishment of such, such uh, European demos. I'm not sure, but I said at the beginning that this is a little provocative approach to this question, but maybe if this global factor will, we will understand better and deeper as now, that is the chance to overcome some of today's problems. Because the, the fear of it is this um, uh, risk of uh, renationalization of European uh, integration, of European politics, especially in some European countries, is absolutely serious, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And what is, what is my, my um, uh, 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 belief that is, if in all Europe members of European Union will have very domestic policy, not very pro-European policy, and increasing national egoism, selfishness, that is absolutely dramatic situation for, for Europe. Because the sum of egoisms will not create some positive European value, never. It can be only, can be only the way to, to, to some conflicts and tensions. So, what's, briefly speaking, what I said, we need China. You know, without China, the integration of European Union is, is under question mark. Hmm. I'm not sure it, was, it was enough provocative? <laughs> Quite provocative. Huh? I don't sure I agree, but uh, let's okay, okay. I don't know, continue with uh, yeah. the, the questions that we'll... Mr. President, when you mentioned the fear that is needed in order to have a move forward on integration, a couple of years ago I also would have thought about the rise of China. Now the first idea that came to my mind is the breakup of Europe. I think we are at a much deeper point of crisis right now. And uh, I would not be completely pessimistic that that kind of the most negative fear, that it all will fail, might still lead to a kind of positive outcome, a deeper integration in some aspects, specifically the fiscal union that you have mentioned. But I think currently it looks like the most likely outcome will be a combined form of deeper integration among some member states and uh, leaving outside and behind some of the other member states. So you might see deeper integration plus desolidarization, which in the long term has plainly one consequence. There won't be a European demos. You cannot have a European demos with an increasingly divided double standard of membership. I think in the end, uh, you know, referring to what Adrien Eritier says, says, you could imagine a European demos in the past that would not take decades to build because we are not engaged in building a European nation. You could imagine, as Habermas did, the European demos as deriving from the institutions and procedures that are legitimate in building Europe. But you cannot possibly think about 
post-enlargement differentiated membership to different classes of uh, uh, being in Europe. That is incompatible with uh, creating a European demos of any kind. And that seems to be a possible outcome even under the most optimistic scenario that the euro will not fail and Europe won't break apart, but it will become a Europe that is increasingly made up of different kinds of member states and citizens. Well, I share your, your um, uh, opinion and, and your fears. Uh, of course, uh, that is quite likely scenario. Of course, yes, but no, the problem uh, today uh, from political point of view is uh, if uh, or um, whether the, 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 the leaders, they understand uh, how the, the, the situation is serious. And because, uh, you know, if not, then the results can be, as, as, as you described, and of course we'll have two groups or three groups even, in my opinion, of, 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 of the members inside European Union, and the process of, of um, frustration which can be very soon um, uh, d d d starts to be a process of, of disintegration. Such, such fear exists. Of course, you know, in Poland we discuss this issue with some fears and hopes. Because uh, even in this bad scenario, because the best, the best scenario, the positive scenario would be that we have a clever decision of the summit, in 2012, we changed treaties. Uh, we have same rules for everybody. We integrate European Union deeper. Uh, we have understanding, good communication with our public opinion, and uh, and it works. Uh, okay, that is very positive, and and uh, I don't know if, if very realistic, uh, but if we will have these two speeds, um, uh, European um, uh, uh, <coughs> countries. Uh, so th th that's that is a challenge for us. Because we are not, I speak about Poland now, we are not a member of, European, of the Eurozone. What, of course, economically is not bad now for Poland. <laughs> uh, we have good economy. This year we'll finish with a growth of uh, almost 4% of GDP. Next year, that is very, very uh, careful prediction of 2.5 to 2.6% growth of GDP. That is still far away from the recession. Uh, we have uh, inflation under control and public debt in Poland is 55%. And you know in the constitution which I prepared before my presidency because I was chairman of constitution committee of Polish General Assembly, we have an article which speaks that Polish public debt cannot be bigger as 60% of GDP. We were in my opinion first European country, it was 97. We decided in the year 97. That is uh, the article in the Polish constitution. So. The, Poland is prepared today to discuss uh, the, the, the conditions of, of our membership or our entry into the Eurozone. And secondly, I'm sure that after these um, um, uh, turbulences inside European Union, in these groups of first and second pace, second speed, Poland has all chances to be in the first group because of the potential, because of, of uh, economy now, because of political stability, because of many, of many reasons. But that is a good scenario for Poland, but for other European countries, including some of today existing countries uh, in, in, in the first uh, group, that is not so, so nice uh, situation. The Italy is a good, good example, but I'm not very much afraid about Italy. I'm sure that the potential here in this country is enough strong to be still in the first group, in the leading group of, 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 of European Union. But how to, uh, and that's his last point, uh, how, to, how to manage the situation? Because I tell you, that, that, that is really dramatic what the leaders can do. Uh, having still in, in their mind uh, elections, uh, ratings, uh, public opinion, uh, coalition partners, you know, many of, of elements of, of, of complicated situation. I understand that Merkel and Sarkozy, with Polish support and support of some important countries in the European Union, they will propose uh, some kind of um, uh, good message for the markets during this summit and during next year. Because if you read yesterday the proposals of Merkel and Sarkozy, they are going forward, but not, not very, very far away. That, that is uh, important, but that's not very re revolutionary approach. And I understand the idea of Sarkozy and Merkel. I didn't speak with them because I'm former president. I can speak with my colleague Chirac, but he, he doesn't speak about all these problems now. <laughs> um, um, uh, well, uh, I understand this, this duo that they want to uh, buy time. 
they want to buy some uh, atmosphere. Uh, that is much more psychological move as uh, strongly political decision. And of course, that gives a chance for 2012 to find some uh, next uh, uh, remedies uh, for the situation. Uh, if it will work, that is of course absolutely okay. Because today, if, if, you, if we describe the crisis correctly, that, the, that is first of all the crisis of confidence, that of course maybe such psychological method will work. Because for, 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 for confidence, psychology is much more important as, as concrete, concrete um, uh, decisions. But for 2012, we have once what would be decided, changes of treaty and more discipline in this fiscal policy, uh, control of the budgets, control of the public debts, etc., etc. Everything is, is possible and that is uh, okay. But we have the problem number two how to create the growth of the economy in Europe, within the European Union. And that is something what, uh, for what we need uh, finance, we need money. And today, if the problem of liquidity uh, in, in Europe will be not resolved, this problem will come again, especially to German government, what to do with central bank, the role of European central bank, what to do with, this, uh, with euro bonds, and how to, simply speaking, a little bit uh, primitively speaking, how to print money. And f because this printing of money is absolutely against such fundamental concept of German policy, because of the history, because of the Weimar Republic, because of the hyperinflation, so on, I think that at the end of next year we can have a real problem. How, because how to discipline budgets, I think we know now, especially after Greece and, 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 and uh, after some other countries, after Italy, we know quite well. But to have balanced budgets in all European countries, this is not enough for growth. That is good for, 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 for discipline, that is good for transparent uh, finances and for, for uh, public um, uh, money, that is, that is absolutely okay, but it is not enough to have growth in, in, in the future. So this problem will, will come back and that is something what I think will be the main challenge for, for uh, next year. And of course, how to uh, predict the consequences of this crisis, that is extremely uh, difficult because, of course, I mentioned what would be the best scenario. But your scenario is bad, but not the worst. This two-pace uh, Europe, three groups of, of, of members, etc., etc. Because if you, we know the history of the economic crisis in the world, especially the crisis of 30s, and some people, they compare the crisis of 30s and to, to, today's crisis, that the result of crisis, the consequence of crisis, is war or revolution or inflation or these three together. You know. And then still, you know, that even the, if, if, a if the consequence of, of, of the crisis is two pace, uh, or two speeds Europe, it's still not revolution, not hyperinflation, and not the war. Well, that is, that is something what, politically speaking, is, is not very optimistic, but it's quite realistic. So, so that's, uh, today I think in Europe we have, um, the, the politics should be combination of two elements, damage of, uh, control, damage control elements, and some progressive moves for the future and how to find the balance between these two instruments, that's, that's, really, that's really the task for, 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 for the best politicians. Do we have, can I, I've got one more question here, perhaps if we just take one more. Did you? Okay? Okay. Thank you. So <clears throat> my question is, uh, if we really need uh, more integration, because you, uh, you politicians, you personally in the speech, or a Polish Minister of Foreign Affairs, they keep saying that yes, we need more uh, uh, integration, more Europe. Yes, maybe now in the times of the crisis, <coughs> it is sort of necessary to somehow deal with the Euro mess, uh, but uh, uh, even if it's indeed true that we need more integration, uh, maybe we should at least have more evidence that more uh, integrate evidence. And I think this is something that is definitely lacking in the public debate. That uh, we say that we need to do it, but uh, 
politicians miss or don't say why uh, we need it or how can we benefit? Um, the, the best what we can do is more Europe, more integration, deeper integration and, and further enlargement in the future as well. And you have quite strong groups of, of, of um, uh, politicians, they are speaking, no, that's, uh, the, the euro was uh, wrong, the base of eurozone was um, um, uh, uh, wrongly decided from the very beginning, we need um, uh, more uh, sovereignty, and even if, if, if some of politicians speaks that we should go back to the national currencies, well, it means that, it's, that, that, that all, everything what happened in Europe during the last 20 or 30 years is, is, um, is, is wrong, and we, we are in the beginning of this way. If you ask me, as a politician who is very pro-European, my answer is more Europe and deeper institutions and so on, I tell you, First of all, this um, uh, European concept works, and in my opinion, even if we uh, did some uh, mistakes during this uh, process, uh, I mentioned, I said, so uh, the, the, the European integration and, and European Union is, is one and maybe the, the best political project in the history of civilization, because it was not by chance happened, it happened because it was a will of, of, of the people, of the politicians, accepted by the, by the people, and the result of that is unbelievable. In the, in the continent, which was the most dangerous continent place in the world in the in, in last many, many centuries. First, but second, and this is much more pro futuro uh, answer, look what's happened in the last 20 years. The world changed and is changing uh, further. We have new architecture of the world. The time of bilateral world of two big blocks, democratic West and communist East, is finished. Communism collapsed and there's no chances, even the better result of Mr. Zhuganov during last election in Russia doesn't mean that communism has a fresh wind in, 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 and, and will, will, will uh, uh, increase its role. That's, that's, that is a part of the history. That's it. Then we had 20 years of unilateral world with the leading uh, position of the United States. What in many places of the world was criticized, in Central Europe not so much, because frankly speaking, we used this time of American dominance quite positive for us. It was not a bad time for this region of, of the world, but I understand that our opinion about American unilateralism can be uh, not, not shared by, by, by everybody. But for us, uh, our entry into NATO uh, and, and, fin and, and, and uh, solution for Balkans, everything was, was with, with important uh, American impact. Okay, and now we have new architecture of the world. And in this new architecture, we have absolutely many centers which will play the dominant influential role in the future. First of all, still United States, of course China, of course, India, of course, Brazil with many countries, Latin American countries uh, surrounding Brazil, Russia with question mark, but still, uh, and even Africa with North African um, uh, countries and with better economy as during last many, many decades is uh, speaking, yes, we are here, we want to participate in this, in this um, uh, new architecture and new order, better to say maybe, of, of the world. If European continent wants to participate in this new order, we should be integrated. Because even the strongest European country, Germany, is maybe too strong, too big, too heavy for Europe, but, but is too small, too uh, uh, weak to be a global player. Germany has no chances to be global pay with 80 million uh, population now and probably 75 million next 20 years or 70 million uh, then uh, with, with huge number of pensioners and, and, and unbelievable high pensions, etc. They have no chances to be such players. So it means that if we want in this new chapter of the history of the civilization, 21st century, if we want as European to, to participate in all these processes, we need integration. And that is very much in favor of all of us, economically, politically, uh, militarily, in any sense of this, of this uh, participation in this, in this uh, new world. And we have the real chances to be 
such player because we didn't start integration yesterday. We have experience of many decades of integration. We created, of course, the, the institutions are very much criticized, but we created many of institutions which are able to, to manage these this, this processes. Uh, I think Euro, even with everything what we can observe now, that, that is some of, of a very, very interesting um, uh, achievements of, of, of European integration. And I'm sure that this uh, achievement will be um, um, uh, repeated by many places which they want to integrate. For example, yesterday I discussed about Euro-Asian um, uh, integration. Uh, that is interesting because you, now we have a problem with Germany, which is maybe too big for Europe. But how to make uh, uh, integration? Russia, Kazakhstan, Belarus, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, and so on. The integration of flies with elephant, that is something like that, you know, this is, that's, this is not easy. But, you know, the first what they want to decide is, 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 is currency, is, is uh, common currency. So, my very brief answer to your question is, if you want, and you are from Gdańsk, and Gdańsk is a city on the coast of Baltic Sea. You see that, I remember, in my age I remember, still. it's not bad with me. Uh, so, on the coast of Baltic Sea. And that is a place of openness, that is a place of vision, that is a place of understanding that we, our chance is if we want, if we want to be and we will be the part of this global world. And if we want to compete with China, 1 billion, 300 million people, with India, 1.3, with Brazil, soon 200, with United States, 300, we need to have 500 million and more especially when we have aging society, when we need young people, when we need uh, very well-educated people, when, when our chance is education, culture, high-tech, and not uh, labor force, the, 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 the simplest uh, labor force. It's everything that is a chance if we will be integrated. If not, and that is my answer to all my opponents speaking about disintegration of Europe, of course. We can have a different scenario, especially Italy is prepared for this scenario, Spain is prepared for this, Poland to some extent is prepared to, to such scenario. The world, this emerging world, this increasing um, uh, superpowers, they need such silent place full of museums, theaters, mm -hmm. good restaurants, you know, to visit, to spend nice vacations, holidays. Uh, you know, if you want to be the director for one of millions of European museums, you have a chance, you know, and you will have a lot of visitors from China, from Japan, from India, from United States, from, from Egypt and so on. And we can, we can, of course, earn a lot of money as, as, as a, the biggest and the most interesting museum of, of, of the civilization in the 21st century. And I tell you, if you are from Dance, you are from Poland, if one day in such museum, you as a, as a, as a director of this museum, you need a special exponent, former president of Poland, I am ready to, to, to participate <laughs> in such project as well. But in my opinion still, that is the, not the most ambitious goal which we can, we can see in front of us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.